this morning we're, in a sense, starting a new series, in a sense, continuing, because the last series was on Jesus' birth and childhood in Matthew, but from here on, we're going to focus on what Matthew really focuses on. If you compare the Gospel of Matthew to the other Gospels, one of the main things you'll notice is that Matthew structures his whole Gospel around these long speeches of Jesus. Uh, the one we're starting with today is the most famous, the Sermon on the Mount. But we'll, this next series will spend 12 weeks or so looking at what Jesus says in all these speeches throughout the Gospel of Matthew. So we begin this morning. The speech begins in Matthew 5, but I'm going to back up just a bit into chapter 4 for the context. So if you want to turn to our reading this morning, it's Matthew 4, 23. And we'll go through 5, verse 16. And let's listen to God's word for us this morning. Jesus went throughout Galilee teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness among the people. So his fame spread throughout all Syria, and they brought to him all the sick, those who were afflicted with various diseases and pains, demon-possessed, epileptics, and paralytics, and he cured them. And great crowds followed him from Galilee the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and from beyond the Jordan. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything, but is thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under the bushel basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Let's pray. Father, we do want to give glory to you by what we say, what we do, what we sing how we interact with one another, and even what we think. I would pray that you would transform us to be Christ-like in this world in every way. And that even this time that is set aside for particularly listening to your word and gathering around your table and being together as a family, that that will be a part of that transformation as each, each of us and all of us become more and more like Jesus. And we pray it in his name. Amen. Many of you will remember this. It's been a couple of years ago now. 
But once when I was out of town, maybe even out of the country, uh, Ryan Burgess uh, preached to the congregation, and he had the audacity to title his message, The Greatest Sermon Ever Preached. Um, I'm not going to promise anything like that. Okay. Uh, of course, he wasn't talking about his own sermon. He was referring to the same one that we're looking at today, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5 through 7. It's the longest speech that we have of Jesus recorded anywhere. And uh, some of the most famous teachings on earth <laughs> from Jesus. So even if you've never cracked a New Testament in your life, some of the things that are in this speech will be familiar to you. But even if you've read it a hundred times, I wonder if you remember that there's actually an earlier sermon in the Gospel of Matthew. Did you know that? There's one that comes before this one in this Gospel. It's a much shorter version. It's in chapter 4, verse 17. From that time, Jesus began to proclaim, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Now, that's a pretty short one. I'm not going to promise anything like that shortness of a sermon either. Um, But you see, just in this one sentence is really the heart of, of the message of the entire Sermon on the Mount. That better known sermon is all about the kingdom of heaven, which may strike us a little more truly, because for us many times we think of kingdom as a a piece of land, it's with borders, but it might strike us more truly if we said the kingship of heaven. What, what it means to be in the kingdom of heaven is to live under the righteous reign of God. And so that's going to be the topic of the entire Sermon on the Mount as well. But even that first word, repent, he's telling people to be transformed from a citizen of a fallen world to a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. Now, before getting into exactly what Jesus says, Matthew sets the scene for us. In chapter 4, verses 23 to 25, Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and curing every disease and every sickness among the people. So his fame spread throughout all Syria, And they brought to him all the sick, those who were afflicted with various diseases and pains, demon-possessed, epileptics, and paralytics, and he cured them. And great crowds followed him from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and from beyond the Jordan. So he sets us up geographically. So let me show you a map of the places that are listed here in verse 25 and where we're talking about. Chris, you've walked the land of some of these places here recently. Um, Of course, Jesus' early ministry is all in the northern region of Galilee. You see the body of water there, the Sea of Galilee. North of that is Syria. Out to the uh, east, across the Jordan, is the Decapolis, five I mean, sorry, ten cities that are um, mostly Gentile cities. Samaria is not mentioned, but it's between Galilee and Judea in the south. But Jerusalem, the capital, and the whole region of Judea are mentioned. And then beyond the Jordan, or some of your translations may say Transjordan, a a, a place also called Perea at times, but the, the southern part across on the east side of the Jordan River. And so it's saying, even though Jesus was up here in the, in the far north, there's people all around in every direction 
are hearing about his healing ministry and his preaching of the kingdom of heaven. And they're flocking to him from this entire region. It's pretty amazing the kind of draw that he has uh, of these of these crowds. And it says these crowds are bringing every people with every disease and every sickness. So these are the kind of people who are flocking to Jesus in his early ministry. This section also gives us a an overview of not just the geographical setting, but the ministerial setting then. What's happening with the people? It says Jesus is teaching in their synagogues. He's proclaiming the good news of the kingdom or the gospel that this kingdom has come near. And he's curing them. And so the people coming to him to hear his teaching and to be touched by him are diseased, tormented, demon-possessed, epileptics, paralytics, etc. And so the people that Jesus speaks his most famous sermon to is a huge crowd of hurting and desperately needy people. That's who he's talking to for these most famous uh, sayings of his. However, there's a group that's even closer to him than those crowds. If you look in chapter 5, first couple of verses, when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. And then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Now this is different from how we do it. Of course, I'm standing to teach right now, and almost every class you've been in, the teacher stands. But for Jews in the first century, it was this was the way to do it. You stand to read Scripture, and you sit down in order to teach. And so Jesus, I don't think he's escaping from the crowds going up the mountain. That may be what I would have been doing. But he goes up on the mountain to, to be seen and heard. And he sits down, and just before this passage, he's called some of his earliest disciples around the Sea of Galilee. And so his disciples come, and they sit closest to him, and it says when he's teaching, they are his first audience. This is a message for insiders to the kingdom of heaven. However, once you get to the end in in chapter 7, you'll see that it says, uh, now when he finished saying these things, the crowds were astound- astounded at his teaching. So the crowds are all certainly overhearing what he's saying, but he's specifically talking to those who have already left a former life in order to follow him. And he starts the message in a very strange way. Now, it's not strange as far as the form of it. The form is very well known to offer a blessing to the person that you're you're speaking to. That happens in the book of Numbers. There's a blessing that Aaron gives to the people. Psalm 1, the very beginning of the songbook of the Old Testament, begins with a blessing. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the way of sinners, but instead meditates on God's word day and night. So that part of it is not strange. The strange part is the, remember the people he's talking to. They seem like the downtrodden. They seem like they've got nothing going their way. They're the last people on earth that anybody would say they're blessed. Now, these are the kind of people who have the good life. These are the kind of people you want to be in the same boat as them. That's what all these blessings are saying. This is the good life. And he's talking about all these people who are diseased and tormented and and demon-possessed. Wow. Now, they're called the Beatitudes because that's a Latin word for blessed. You could just as easily call them the blessings. And uh, depending on how how you count them, uh, 
you could maybe include verses 11 and 12 with them, but I think it's just verses 3 to 10, the eight blessings. And these will be familiar to most of you. But I've put them on the, on the screen here in columns so that you see the group of people that he's talking to and the promises that he's making to them about what life is going to be like if you're in the kingdom. And so it's not, a, it's not like here's a group of people if you're poor in spirit and there's another group of people who are meek and there's another group of people who are peacemakers. This is a way of talking to the same group. But in these eight different blessings, he says, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn and are meek. They hunger and thirst for righteousness. They are merciful. They are pure in heart. They are peacemakers. And they are persecuted for the sake of righteousness. You notice that these Beatitudes, unlike uh, the ones in Luke, which I think is a different time and a, and a different sermon altogether, but it's similar. He says blessings and woes to people in Luke, but they seem to be focused on material blessings or uh, being rich or poor in a material sense. But here Matthew, in Matthew, he's certainly talking about the spiritual sense. Instead of saying just poor, he says poor in spirit. Instead of saying just hungry, he says, hungering for righteousness. Not only persecuted, but persecuted for righteousness' sake. And I also want you to notice the first and last have the same promise. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So that's a way of framing the entire list. Opening and closing with the same promise, but also notice that those are the only ones that are in the present tense. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven right now. The kingdom belongs to such as these. All the ones in the middle have a future blessing in mind. They will be comforted. They will inherit the earth. They will be filled. They will receive mercy. They will see God. They will be called sons of God. And so these people are in the present, they are included in the kingdom of heaven. And that's the greatest blessing. But there's also these future blessings promised where their emptiness in all these different ways is going to be filled. These are people who are hurting and who are desperately needy. And Jesus says, you're blessed. If I was going to summarize what kind of people he's talking about, I would say, first off, they're humble. Okay, Another word for meek. But even poor in spirit um, would be another way of saying they, they recognize their dependence on God and their low position before God. I realize that I have spiritual need. I'm, I have spiritual poverty and I can't rely on myself for spiritual blessing, but humbly rely on God for that. The other, the other part of it, besides being humble, is being loyal. Being absolutely loyal to God, showing Him absolute fidelity regardless of what happens even through suffering even through being persecuted being insulted um, that these are the kind of people who stick with God regardless of the circumstances and so those who are humble toward God and loyal toward Him in the way they behave in the world, even though they're suffering, these are the people who are blessed. These are the people who are citizens of the kingdom that Jesus brought. Now, 
after these blessings, in verses 11 and 12, he again starts by saying blessed. That's why I said you could count this in. But there's a real shift here. In those first eight, he says they will be comforted. They will see God. Everything's in the third person. But here he turns and speaks directly to the audience in the second person now. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely because of me. See, Jesus puts himself right in the middle of their situation. This isn't just abstract. He said, it's because you're following me as faithful, loyal citizens of my kingdom, you're going to suffer in this world. You will be persecuted. But you're blessed if that happens to you. You're blessed if you suffer because you wear the name Christian. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Rejoice, rejoice. He says your reward is great in heaven. This is going to be a common theme throughout the whole sermon. The reward is with God. You're not seeking a reward here on earth. The reward is with God. But I want you to notice here too, because we always think of heaven as future, we may automatically place this blessing in the future. But it's not so much in heaven after you die, but in heaven with God right now. That's where we seek the reward. Is We don't want a reward from other people, a temporary reward. We want an eternal reward with God. So that's who we want to please. That's who we want to serve. And he says, great is your reward in heaven, not great will be your reward in heaven. It is now. And he connects these people. I mean, think, of, think about who's sitting in front of him. Even his closest disciples, he's just picked up off the Sea of Galilee as fishermen. These are, these are nobodies, every single one of them. And yet he connects them to the faithful prophets of the Old Testament. Those who spoke the word of God and often were rejected by their people as well. And he says, you're just like them. You're just like these prophets, our heroes from the past, who were faithful to God regardless of the circumstances. Now, this is how their society treated them. So don't be surprised if your society treats you that way. You want to be an insider to this kingdom. You're blessed if you are. Now, the next section in every Bible I looked at this week, there's a division between verse 12 and verse 13. There's a new heading. Look at your Bible. If anybody has a Bible that doesn't do that, let me know. So I'll be surprised. I looked at quite a few. And so, I've always just thought of this as its own distinct teaching and not really seen it in the context of the setting, and these blessings, and it just continues. And so this, it's not a separate section. In fact, he continues to say, you. He's speaking directly to his audience. And although the world around them may say, these are the scum of the earth, Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth, and you are the light of the world. And in these two addresses, he, he's giving them their identity as citizens of the kingdom. You are the salt of the earth, and you are the light of the world. Now, that's quite the statement. That's a very privileged position for Jesus to speak to you and say you're the salt of the earth, the light of the world. 
Now, salt has a, a lot of different uses, and uh, I'm sure you've heard sermons on all the uses of salt and what it could mean, and I, I'm sure all of those are valid. It seems to me, though, the way the word salt is used by God in the Old Testament, the most common place that it's used is in the phrase, the salt of the covenant. And um, you can find that in Leviticus and I think in Second Chronicles. God says that His covenant with His people is a covenant of salt and that they ought to have uh, salt. Some of their sacrifices involve salt and then He'll say, it's the salt of the covenant. This is focusing uh, mostly on the quality of being a preservative. Salt being added to uh, food so that it doesn't spoil and it keeps. And so when God says it's a covenant of salt, you know that it's permanent. It's eternal. It's not going to go bad. It will never perish, spoil, or fade. This is what God typically means when he uses the word salt in the Old Testament. And so here when Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth, he's saying you are this permanent presence that I have called to be here in this world. With light, of course, the, the function of light is illumination. It's often used for uh, God giving us wisdom on how to live. Your word is a light to my feet. Um, but I think here, as you follow what Jesus is teaching, that he's saying, yes, this is a position of privilege, but it's a position of purpose as well. There's a lot of responsibility that goes with being the salt of the earth and the light of the world. And what he seems to be most concerned with is that those who are supposed to be salt will stop being salty, and those who are supposed to be light will stop being bright. He says, if salt's lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It's not good anymore. It's no longer being the salt of the earth. Now, if he said, you are the salt of the earth, and he's saying, if you lose your flavor that I've, that I've purposed for you, then what good are you but to be cast out and trampled underfoot? You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hidden. Now, this struck me, again, in the context, because where is he? He's on a hill. Who's around him? A city's worth of people. A city on the hill can't be hidden. We're up here on this mountain, and we're totally exposed. You're the light of the world. He says, but no one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket, but they put it on a lampstand, and it gives light to all. Now, just for the sake of an illustration, I need a lampstand here. I know you would call this a podium, but I'm calling it a lampstand for now. Okay, and here I have a lamp. Now, I didn't go to Israel to get this, Chris, um, but it's a, it's a replica of an authentic Herodian lamp from the first century. Now, it was made in the mountains of Judea, but I got it from an exotic land called Amazon. <laughs> and uh, I wanted to see the kind of lamp that Jesus would have had in mind. What kind, of, what kind of lamp is Jesus thinking about when he says, you are the light of the world? Now, Jesus also did not have one of these the automatic lighter, but I didn't trust uh, bringing matches up here. Now, what is authentic about it is that it's burning olive oil. And Jesus would say, nobody lights a lamp 
And then they cover it with a basket. Why would you do that? It's going to put out your light. It's going to burn your basket up, possibly. <laughs> the main thing is the, light, the house is still going to be dark. But if you put it on a lampstand, I'm sure every single one of you can see this light. And if we blacked out all the windows and shut the light, I'm sure it would illuminate quite a bit, just one little flame. But Jesus seems here to be concerned that citizens of his kingdom will stop living as citizens of his kingdom because of the pressure of the world. And he says, what good are you going to be at that point? If I, Jesus, have called you, my disciples and crowds, to be the salt of the earth, and you're not being the salt of the earth, then how is Jesus going to influence the world? If you're not being the light of the world, then how's Jesus going to influence the world? How's God going to do what he's been doing all throughout redemption? We see throughout the whole Bible. So now you're part of it, and I'm relying on you to do your part. So don't lose your saltiness. Don't lose your light. And I think the, the best adjectives for these words that I could come up with, one of them's familiar, but it's loyalty and truth. If you, if you follow the meanings of, of light and salt throughout the Bible, I think this is the closest to what Jesus is saying. I need people who are loyal to me, loyal to God, regardless of what happens. That's the only kind of citizens I can use in this kingdom. Those who are fiercely loyal to God and Christ. And I need those who are absolutely committed to the truth. And not just hearing the truth, not just taking in the truth, but shining the truth to other people. Proclaiming this message with me that the kingdom of heaven has come near. I have graciously been brought into it. God wants you to be graciously brought into it as well. And as we go about with that message, the same message that Jesus brought, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. We go about in the world as that, spreading that message, we are the salt of the earth, fully flavored, fully preserving, fully loyal, and we are the light of the world, bringing absolute truth and illumination and wisdom and influence that God wants to have. Because he's created all people, and he wants to draw them to himself. But he's going to use those first people that he draws to himself, he's going to use to bring in the next people that he draws to himself. And he uses them to bring in the next people that he'll draw to himself. This is God's mode of operation. And so kingdom citizens have got to stay salty and bright or the world has no hope. And of course, it's not because we're anything special. Because we're just <coughs> desperately needy, hurting people. Jesus is actually the one who makes this complete. He is the salt of the earth. He is the light of the world. He is meek. He is merciful. He is pure in heart. He is a peacemaker. He is persecuted for the sake of righteousness. So absolutely loyal to God and willing to suffer that he would go to the cross by God's command and out of love for you who had nothing to offer to him except gaping need. And since Jesus is the salt of the earth and the light of the world, we're called to be that too. 
we're called to become Christ-like for the sake of the world that God loves. So that not just the church, but the whole world will be blessed. Let's pray. Father, we are privileged to have been called into your kingdom. A kingdom that is right side up when the whole world is upside down. Where those at the top are servants. Those at the bottom get exalted with honor. Father, we want to be in this kingdom. Help us to humble ourselves before you. To recognize our spiritual need and our every need. And to turn to you for that. Because you're the provider of all things, we... We become grateful people, thankful people, loyal people, willing to take both blessing and suffering from your hand because we trust you. God, help us to not fail the calling, but to be like Jesus, to be salt and light to be bold and compassionate that you might have your way in us, in me as a Christian, in us as a congregation, in our city, in our state, our nation, our world. God, help us catch a vision for this kingdom that Jesus has brought near. and to be found faithful citizens. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.